Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Please get cozy as we jump right into these Bigfoot and paranormal encounters. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe and ding that notification bell. I post new videos every single day and you'll be notified when they go live. Okay, let's get into it. Back in the mid 90s, I was out in Rosedale, Illinois, just minding my own business picking up creek stones for my wife's flower bed. You know how it is, just going about your day, not expecting anything out of the ordinary. The stretch of Rosedale Valley is about two to three miles long. There's this road, Coon Creek Road, that winds through it with a creek on one side. And then on the other side, there's this open field that stretches up to the hillside. Both sides of the valley are these thick woods and the terrain can get pretty steep. I had been down there by the creek, tossing those stones up by the road. I must have walked about a mile and a half down that creek, and I was on my way back to the van, and that's when things got weird. It's like all of a sudden, my senses were on high alert, and the hair on the back of my neck stood up. Have you ever had that feeling? Like something's not quite right? Anyway, I stopped in my tracks, just looking around, trying to figure out what set off my instinct. And then I saw it, this massive dark thing on the hillside across the field. At first, I thought it might be a tree stump or something, but there was something off about it. It was this dark brown to dusty gray color, and it was swaying from side to side real slow. I couldn't take my eyes off it, like I was in a trance or something. And then, out of nowhere, it stood up. I mean, picture this. This tall figure, like seven to eight feet, covered in hair, just standing there. And the weirdest part, the more we stared at each other, the more that swaying got intense. It was like some kind of standoff, and I was locked in this silent conversation with whatever this thing was. But you know how it goes, right? Reality finally snapped back, and I was booking it back to the van, adrenaline pumping, heart racing the whole nine yards. And as I was sprinting, I could see this creature, whatever it was, starting to make its way up that steep hillside. Now that is no easy feat, my friend, but it was like it knew I was spooked and it was just showing off. The crazy part is, as it was climbing, it turned around and looked back at me one more time, like it wanted to make sure I was getting a good view of its disappearing act. I mean, can you imagine? It's the kind of thing that makes you question reality, you know? I've shared the story with folks, and I've gotten my fair share of reaction. Some laughed, some raised eyebrows, but let me tell you, when you lock eyes with something that's way out of the ordinary, it sticks with you. And that swaying, hair-covered mystery on that hillside? Well, it's a memory that's gonna stay with me for a long, long time. I hope you liked that encounter, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, comment, and subscribe as those things really help by pushing this video in the algorithm and getting it in front of as many people as possible, which I would really appreciate. On to the next one. My brother-in-law, his wife, and I all decided that for my husband's upcoming 40th birthday, we were going to camp out at a gorgeous secluded river a state away that none of us had ever been to before. But that all of us had always wanted to go to. We were all really into camping and spending time outdoors, so we were as excited for him to receive the gift as we all were to go on the trip with him. To keep the storytelling easier, let me introduce the four of us. My name is Molly, my husband is Kevin, my brother-in-law's name is Kent, and his wife's name is Misty. The four of us went to college together, with me and Misty being best friends, and the boys being not only brothers, but twins. 
spending so much time together. They are fraternal twins, and you can tell the two of them apart. Anyway, my husband's birthday is in the beginning of September, and in California, in our opinion, there's no better time to go camping near a water source. We weren't sure if the water was going to be swimmable, but the men loved to fly fish, and we knew they would at the very least be able to do that. We wanted to plan the three nights and four days during the week so it wouldn't be as crowded, but because the area was a place we only knew about because my grandfather had told me about it, and not because it was some sort of popular tourist destination or attraction, made us feel like it honestly didn't matter one way or the other, and that, at the very least, it wouldn't be too crowded. Plus, when we looked at the map, and with how my grandfather had explained it to us, there could be several families of people there, and no one would even be aware of the others, except in a sort of peripheral way. We were leaving on a Monday, and would arrive early Tuesday morning, which was his birthday. All we told him was we had a surprise for him, and while he knew it was going to be camping, he had no idea where we were going. He was in good spirit and excited about it, though, and finally the day came. Misty and Kent stayed the night the Sunday before so that we could leave at a more reasonable hour and not have to wait for them. We all wanted to leave together and travel in the same vehicle. It was starting off like it was going to be the trip of a lifetime, and I guess in many ways it was. Too bad it was terrifying and ruined me being in secluded spots of wilderness for years. We got there at around six in the morning, and for the last 45 minutes of the drive into the middle of nowhere, we made Kevin wear a blindfold. Luckily, he was such a good sport, and it ended up being an extremely pleasant surprise when we pulled up into the area. This place was far off the main roads, and it had been more than an hour since we had seen another human being or another house at all. We knew we were in the middle of nowhere, but when we saw how pristine and just how gorgeous that river was, we all felt like we had died and gone to heaven. Despite how far out of the way it was, we did find it a little bizarre that there wasn't a single other family or human being out there with us. And from the looks of it, we were there all by ourselves and had our pick of where we wanted to set up our camp. We chose a spot not too far from the river so that we could hear it running as we slept, but far enough away that we couldn't see it from where we would be sleeping. The first day, the men went fly fishing, and because we had absolutely zero interest in fishing at all, Misty and I just hiked around and got a glimpse of what the land itself looked like. There weren't too many hills or peaks, but there were some out there. The deeper we went into the woods, we scouted out a route we wanted to hike with the men the next day, and everyone was just in great spirit, until dusk fell, that is. Once the sun was just starting to go down over the horizon, we all were suddenly hit with such an intense feeling of being watched that Kevin and Kent went around the perimeter of our camp with their flashlights, looking to see if there was anyone else out there and if they were sneaking around our area. They were gone for a little over an hour, and when they returned, they were more confident than ever that we were the only beings out there in those woods. Misty and I had been certain of that fact as well due to how far and wide we had hiked into the forest earlier that day. We all still couldn't shake the feeling of being watched and somewhat stalked, but we chose to put it to the back of our minds so that we could continue having a good time. None of us drank due to one of us having some serious addiction issues in the past and the others not wanting to trigger him. So we were all of a sound mind when we laid down for bed that night. It was around midnight when we finally put the fire out and got into our tent to go to sleep. We knew we didn't really have to be up that early the next day, but wanted to get a somewhat early start 
because of the miles we intended on covering for our hike. The sound of the water and the sound of the forest easily lulled me to sleep, and before I knew it, I had drifted off. I woke up to what sounded like someone screaming in the woods. The sound was echoing all around us and reverberating through the trees. All four of us exited the tent at the exact same time, and we all were very worried. It sounded like a woman was being murdered or something out there. We had no cell phones, they didn't exist at that time, and we hadn't seen another home, building, or human at all for more than an hour when we had been driving in there. So we didn't know what to do. The men wanted to go and look to see if they could find whoever it was and maybe help them. But Misty and I were adamant that they stay with us. It wasn't that we were being selfish, but our husbands weren't the toughest of men and neither of them had thought to bring any sort of weapon with them. There was probably nothing they could have done even if they had found whoever was screaming out there or the person who was causing them to do so. We all stood there frantically looking around and shining flashlights into the woods while also screaming out to whoever it was and asking if they needed help for about 10 minutes. The only reply we were getting was more random screaming until suddenly the whole forest went quiet again. It didn't just fall silent as far as the screaming had stopped either, and it seemed like everything that lives out in those woods, even the normal animals and insects you would expect to hear and that we had heard all day and night up until that point, had suddenly gone totally mute. It was so quiet we couldn't even hear the river anymore. It almost made our ears start ringing. My husband and I walked back down to the river just to look at it. I don't really know what we were expecting to find, but because I couldn't hear it, none of us could, I wanted to go and see just to make sure it was out there or something. I really don't understand my train of thought at the time when I look back on it all now. Eventually, it took about 45 minutes, but we were all settled back inside of our tent and sleeping again. I woke up trying to scream with nothing coming out as I was dragged by my ankles out of the tent. I was also trying to kick and fight and flail my arms around, but I couldn't move a muscle and could only lie there silently, screaming and terrified as something dragged me out of the tent and away from my husband. He didn't wake up and he didn't move an inch at all of that was going on. I could move my eyeballs, head and neck though, and easily saw what was pulling me out onto the ground outside of the tent. It was a humanoid that looked very much like a real man. If I hadn't been into the paranormal and the supernatural as much as I was, that's probably what I would have thought was happening too. However, I knew better and could see right away that whatever that thing was, it was only appearing to me as a man. It had very pale white skin, a short top hat, huge black eyes that looked like what we always draw on gray aliens nowadays, and it looked like his eyes were bleeding black and very dark red blood. It almost looked like the blood had been painted on. Once he had me, Laying outside of the tent and unable to move my body, he walked away. And I saw him go into my brother in law's tent and start dragging Misty outside of it. All I could do was lie there, helplessly watching as he dragged her out by her ankles. My mind was racing, wondering what this thing was going to do with us, and I could immediately see her looking all around until she found me and we made eye contact. I tried mouthing to her that it would be all right, but once again, I couldn't move and even my mouth wouldn't budge, no matter how hard I was trying. He finished dragging her out completely and then came back over to me. He leaned in close to my face and he smelled like rotten fish and smoke from a raging fire. There was also the underlying scent of decomposition there somewhere too, and I was afraid I would choke on my own vomit. I tried to turn my head, but at that moment, 
my head and neck became paralyzed as he leaned in and forced me to look directly into his giant, insect-looking eyes. His eyes burned bright red for about 30 seconds, and as he stared at me, I felt like my eyes were burning and would melt at any moment right out of the socket. Then he went over to Misty and seemed to be doing the exact same thing. The next thing I remember, it was morning, and I was waking up with the sun shining directly on top of me, still lying in that same exact spot outside of the tent. I immediately jumped up and looked all around, and saw Misty also just waking up and realizing what had happened to her the night before. She ran over to me, and we hugged one another and cried. We were basically hysterical as we loudly discussed what had happened to us the night before. Our husbands, of course, heard us and were very concerned when they came outside to greet us. Once we calmed down, we tried repeatedly to tell them what had happened to us. But they refused to listen and said we were either dreaming or it had been a person. In the case of it being a person, they wanted to go find the nearest police station and report it. Misty and I were adamant that it isn't possible for two people to have the exact same nightmare at the exact same time, and we were also both completely sure it wasn't a human male that had done it to us. The men eventually concluded, based on our unwillingness to report the incident and our insistence that it was something not of this world and possibly demonic, posing as a man that had attacked us, that we were just messing with them. It eventually got to the point where they were getting angry that we wouldn't stop, and we were angry and hurt they weren't believing us or taking us seriously. Before I knew what happened, we were all arguing loudly with one another, and that's when I just happened to look over towards the river. I saw that demonic creature just standing there, peeking out from behind a tree. It had a look of absolute pleasure on its face, and looked like it was really enjoying itself and the pain it was causing currently. I pulled Misty aside and told her we should just let it go until we got home, and that's exactly what we did. She and I were absolutely terrified for the rest of our time there, but we felt like that's exactly what the entity or demon, whatever it was, had wanted to begin with, and that perhaps it was feeding itself with our pain and terror and all the drama we were experiencing because of it. We tried our best not to show fear when we would see the entity creeping around, its eyes burning bright through the trees for only she and I to see. Once night had fallen again, we knew it was around because the forest had gone completely silent and still, but we forced ourselves to laugh anyways and pretend everything was fine. It was extremely hard but worth it because it didn't come back that night and we didn't see it again for the rest of the times we were there. I've since done a tremendous amount of research on this creature, but as expected, I haven't really found anything credible except that it is more than likely a demonic entity or evil for a spirit that preys on innocent people. That since it was only presenting itself with the way that it looked, except for maybe the eyes, and there's no way of knowing what it really looked like. I've had a few more experiences, always in the desolate woods while camping or hiking, with forest spirits and creatures I would otherwise describe as monsters, but that's all for this one. Be careful out there, and in my opinion, no one should ever go anywhere where they will be totally and fully alone. You never know what will find you out there where no one can hear you scream. I am very excited to announce that on this channel we are offering membership. Now, I never want my subscribers to feel like I am paywalling content, so new videos will remain 100% completely free. The membership is a way for those who feel like they want to support me to do so and help the channel grow monetarily. What your membership gives you access, though, to are subscriber badges, which evolve with how long you've been a member, 
and you can watch your badge grow from a baby Bigfoot all the way up to a sage Bigfoot. Also, as a member, you'll get access to member-only emojis, which are these beautiful Bigfoot emojis. Again, I never want to paywall any content on this channel. I always want the content to be free because I love the community and I want you to enjoy your time here. But if you do wish to support me making this content, this membership is a way for you to do that. Thanks for listening and on to the next one. I was traveling as a passenger with a local resident from Del Notre County, who was making a trip to Crescent City to go grocery shopping. It was at 11 a.m., a bright and sunny morning. As I rode along, the lady giving me a ride into town told me to look out my window to the right. I looked to see what she was talking about, and I saw a very large, hairy creature walking across a wide, dried-up creek bed. There were no trees or anything blocking my view. It was a wide open expanse. I did not see its face because I was seeing it from the side. I only saw it on its right side. It was headed in the opposite direction that we were going. To our left, I distinctly remember a watch out for falling rock sign. I do not know the area there well. I was only camping there for a few days on my way back from Topanga Canyon in LA to Oregon where I live in the Cave Junction area, I will never forget what it looked like. It had long, darkish brown hair that covered its entire body. It also had a pronounced crown in the shape of the top of its head. It looked extremely muscular. I was at least 500 feet away, and I'm not real good at judging height anyways. So I don't know how tall it was, it walked with ease across a rocky creek bed. It seemed to ignore or be unaware of our car's presence on the road. We were probably traveling about 30 miles per hour when it happened. My friend told me she sees them all the time out there near her home, so it was just a normal thing for her. It was just lots of trees, mainly conifers like fir with some pine. This area is a lot like where I live in Oregon, some hardwood, like oak and mandrone, it's really not that far from the Oregon border, especially as a crow flies. On to the next one. In Monachi Meadows on the South Fork of Kern River in Tulare County in California, this was near Black Rock. Norm and I hunt the Monachi Meadow area. We had camped at Summer Ridge that night. At about two in the morning, this loud howl of immense volume coming from one of the meadows. Yes, it did have a sad tone to it, but it did not seem threatening. We got into the Jeep and started spotlighting the meadow. After an hour of this, the loud howl went away. We retreated to our camp for some unnerving sleep. But ever since this encounter, our group always looks for signs of this big creature. Up on South Fork of the Kern River, Menachee Meadows is at 8,000 feet. It's high and very cold at night. The South Fork of Kern River runs through it, and it has lots of deer, bear, cougars, fish, and now Bigfoot. On to the next one. I was a logger for 15 years in and around Northern California, and I was a timber faller probably five years out of that period. Timber falling puts you out in the really remote areas, and we were always the first guys in there to drop the timber. I started working a real thick area and began working my way back through the thick woods. My plan was to reach the very back portion of the sail and then cut my way back toward the logging road. The first day in there, I had the feeling of being watched, thinking it was just our boss spying on us. I gave no further thought to it. The next morning, I spotted large tracks in the muddy areas. It had rained hard that night, so the tracks were not sharp, 
and they were not from a bear. Further into the woods, I came upon a flat spot in the faint trail that smelled so terrible that I almost gagged. It smelled like a wet dog, a very filthy wet dog. Just past this spot is where I spotted what appeared to be human-looking droppings. What was weird about the droppings is they were really huge. Not trying to act like an expert on droppings, but the largest piece was about 18 inches long and three inches in diameter. This really freaked me out because there was nobody else in the area. My partner was working over the other slope and actually went out another way. The cruises were out of this area about two months back. This stuff was fresh looking, about a day or two old tops. My partner was a Native American and I didn't know the guy that well. We just paired up for that season. At quitting time, I sort of approached him about the idea of Bigfoot, and he said they have been in these woods forever, and my people have told me many stories about them. You white guys just make fun of whatever the Indian talks about, so we keep it to ourselves, and that was about it. I guess if I took him to a bar on Friday night and got his tongue oiled up a bit, I'd have learned a bit more, but I dropped the subject. We finished the sale, and that was it. This area was really secluded with lots of deer sign. I had a habit of mapping and remembering really good spots for future deer hunting and prospecting spots that I would use during the winter layoff. This particular spot after logging was strictly off limits as it was part of the fruit grower company's land and after logging, they would lock up the roads. It didn't matter how long you logged their property after a sale. It was shut down and you had to stay out. Well, hunting season arrived and I breached the lock gate and snuck in there for a day of hunting. I took along my ever-present companion, Pappy, my hunting cow dog. Him and I were inseparable because he didn't know fear and would attack a grizzly if you didn't keep him under control. He had a good nose and located many a deer that got away from me. Well, we got into the same area that I had spotted the droppings and Pappy went on purple alert. His fur went straight up and he acted totally weird. He came to a halt and refused to go any further down the trail. I never saw him act quite this way. Just 100 yards up the hill, I spotted movement. It was crouching down behind a buckbrush bush and it was just crouching there staring at us. It was completely unnerving. I realized I was illegally in that area and this might be another hunter or a DGF cop ready to bust my butt. Note, guys were always getting busted for hunting on the California line or the Oregon line. It was just a bad spot and it was so close to each border it would be up to the game warden. Well, I had a Remington rifle in a 270 caliber with a 3x9 scope, and not really wanting to aim a rifle at another hunter, I sort of swept the total area like I was looking for deer. What I saw chilled me to the bone. It was not human, and that's about all that I can really say to this day. It looked like a king-sized Eddie Munster, and it didn't look ape-like, but as sure as heck wasn't a human. The eyes were what got my legs going because I wasted no time getting back to my truck and getting out of there. There had been lots of UFO activity in the area for years. Lots of stories from the Indians and other loggers. This area is located very close to Happy Camp, California, where there are a lot of sightings. Also, the Roger Patterson sighting is only about 80 miles down the river. The area was thickly forested with lots of mountains, streams, and creeks, and very few roads. On to the next one. When I returned to my boyhood home in Shiprock, New Mexico, for a family emergency, I felt a certain peace being back among my Dene people once again. I was home because my mother had called me when my younger brother, Tim, had suddenly gone into a coma. The doctors hadn't a clue as to what was wrong. After the usual hugs and how you been, I took mom up to the hospital where I spoke with Timmy's doctor 
and he asked me to speak with him in private, leaving Mother alone with Tim. I was a bit on edge when the doctor locked his door and had his receptionist hold his call. I was sitting on the edge of my chair as the doctor leaned over his desk and spoke in low tones that he had been unable to diagnose what was wrong with my brother, but that he was not totally unfamiliar with this type of problem. He had seen it before, but he quietly explained that he did not believe that Tim's coma was a medical issue. Then, as though a weight had been lifted from him, he let out a sigh, leaned forward again, and very quietly said that I should call Uncle Clayton. This statement both frightened me and gave me hope. I then understood what was wrong with my brother was fortunately not a sickness. The frightening part was that a very highly respected medical specialist was telling me that he believed the cure for Tim was in our tribe's native witchcraft for lack of any better explanation. Merely mentioning Uncle Clayton brought instant understanding to my struggling mind as the doctor's knowledge of Clayton's relationship with my family was evident and all too obvious. What the doctor was telling me was that I should seek help from beyond his expertise, but that he had seen this type of coma before, and it was unique among our tribe, enough so that he was making a professional referral to a Navajo witch. The American Medical Association would be amazed to know they had competition in the healing profession. After thanking the doctor, I looked in on my brother. I held Tim's hand and whispered to him that help was on the way, and I thought I felt a slight squeeze in return. But maybe that was wishful thinking. I leaned over and whispered to Mom that the doctor recommended Uncle Clay and the surprised look on her face, and then her more relaxed attitude told me she understood. The doctor had also seemed to relax when he saw that he needn't spend the time trying to teach me about the great mysteries of our people. Reading between the lines, my brother's symptoms were not, according to the doctor, something that modern medicine could treat, and I now would need the help of the Yi Naldushi, in other words, the skinwalker. Mother seemed at ease in the knowledge that I knew much more about Uncle Clay and my father's relationship with him than she had realized. Many people believe strongly in witches, as do all native tribes believe in medicine men, shamans, and many other names. But witches are the same. In our tribe, we have several levels of our healers that include Adishkash, which is our main healer. There is another member that also has the ability to change its physical appearance called shape-shifting. This person can freely change his appearance to other figures. History of our tribe teaches that the shapeshifter, which came about in the early times when Spanish soldiers were kidnapping our people to work as slaves in their Mexican gold and silver mines. The shapeshifting ability allowed our secret members to change into birds, lizards, rabbits, anything to spy on the Spanish and warn our people. This may be difficult for many people to believe, but all of our people are deathly afraid of the Yi, so your listeners may understand my cautionary approach to helping my brother. The Yi Naldoshi is the ultimate enforcer. Uncle Clayton, or Clay, is not actually our family's uncle. In fact, I doubt that he is related to us at all. But when father was alive, the two men were as close as brothers, maybe even closer. As I was growing up, Clay was at all important family functions. Every time we had any get-together, it was assumed and required that Uncle Clay be present. Later, as I grew older and began to mature, I heard things that soon made me aware that Clay and my father were more than appeared to be. Once I was mature enough to comprehend the awesome powers held by the Yi Naldoshi, father took me out into the desert and we sat huddled around a late March campfire, and he explained to me that Uncle Clayton was, by a secret Navajo ceremony, closer to father than even a true brother by blood could ever be. 
he went on to explain that their minds were so closely attuned to one another that what one thought, the other heard. When father passed a few years ago, Uncle Clay spent days and nights mourning in close proximity to his gravesite, which, according to our tradition, is unmarked. It was apparent to me that father had told me the truth about how he felt toward Clay, and Clay obviously showed it to be a fact. After I returned to my mother's home, I asked her to call Uncle Clay about Tim, and less than half an hour after that, I heard the rumble on the gravel road, and I assumed either to be a jet landing or Uncle Clay. It was the latter, in a monstrous-looking Humvee, and after he waited until the huge dust cloud settled, out stepped a dapper-looking gentleman, wearing a large Stetson hat, a calfskin vest, beautiful alligator boots, and a rodeo belt buckle that sent the sun in every direction. Yes, just as I remembered him. We embraced as always, but this time I felt a stronger embrace, as if, in my mind, I was being accepted by this impressive man as an equal, rather than merely a nephew. Mother was soon disappearing in the arms of this giant man, and then Clay quickly looked at me and assumed that this was men's work. This assumption of Uncle Clay's part pleased me immensely as we walked out on the patio and took seats on the short wall rather than the chairs at the dining table. During our conversation, I noticed that Clay kept a constant vigil, as his eyes noted every bird, shadow, and even the lizard scurrying across the desert a good fifty feet beyond the wall. After explaining the circumstances and our visit to Tim in the hospital, and that it was the doctor's recommendation to contact him, Clay straightened with obvious pride as he turned to directly face me and told me that he considered me to be as my father was to him, his closest worldly friend. As my father had been, one he could trust him implicitly. I held out my hand in agreement, and immense pride to have the honor that my father had enjoyed before me. Then, after exchanging cell phone numbers with me, his monster vehicle headed back down the road. An hour later, my phone jerked me to attention, and Clay's voice seemed very relaxed and unconcerned which wasn't at all the panic I was anticipating. He calmly instructed me to drive down to the bank and park in the rear parking lot by Merriman's store. He told me he had described my car, and when I parked, Clay said a man would walk out and hand me a bank bag. He said the man would first ask for the code word, which was chip, and then, as much appreciated aside, Clay said, as in chip of the old block, I was then to bring the bag to an old abandoned brick and adobe building in the old part of town, which he knew I used to hide out at when I skipped school. As I drove to my destination, I pondered over what Uncle Clay had just told me, that Tim's problem occurred when he failed to pay off a gambling debt. I arrived at Merriman's parking lot. I had hardly turned off the ignition when a man appeared at my door, asking for the password and when I said chip, he virtually dumped the bank bag in my lap and was gone. Following Clay's instructions, I headed up the old decaying street to my next destination. When I pulled up to the ancient crumbling brick plant, there stood two vehicles. The monster Humvee that looked like Clay must have run through the car wash by the barely noticeable traces of dust, and next to it was a wretched-looking, trashy old Malibu with only enough of a windshield without cracks to barely see through. It had so many dents, it looked like a derby car. There, standing beside Clay, was a weaselly and unclean-looking spider of a man, with a two-day-old beard and a Lucky Strike cigarette between his fingers. I was reminded of what my father would surely have remarked looking at this person. His mother should be severely beaten for allowing it to live. I must have still had a trace of a smile on my face at the remembrance from Uncle Clay's look as I handed him the bank bag. Then Clay handed the unkempt man the bag, and we watched as the Weasley character walked to his car. We could see him counting the money. Weasel then reached into his car for his cell phone, and we could see him talking and nodding. 
and then he returned, carrying his phone, saying it would take a few minutes. Then the man's phone rang, and when he turned to Clay, he said, done. Before he could leave, Clay made him wait while he also made a call, and he was smiling as he gave me a nod. Then Clay told Weasel to go, as he gestured to go back way out of town, saying he didn't want to be seen with him. The man frowned, but with a shrug, he started his smoky beast and carefully followed the rutted dirt road down the steep hill that led behind an entire row of abandoned and deserted block and adobe buildings that were fading from sight and memory. It was then that Clay told me the call he had placed earlier was to Mom, and he said that the hospital had already brought Timmy home, and he was eating like he had been starved. I started to head back to my car, but Clay put his hand on my arm, and I stood alongside him as he obviously had wanted. Together, we watched Weasel's car lurching and squeaking from side to side as he traversed the heavily rutted road. His arm was on top of the door, an obvious sign of defunctive air conditioning at these hot temperatures. He proceeded ever so slowly, lurching and bouncing from side to side, when suddenly a monstrous-sized black behemoth of a dog appeared out of nowhere and leapt right in the open passenger window. The car began swerving drastically, and I was struck with a vision of the man being shredded by the fangs of the enormous beast, when, just as quickly, the animal leapt out the driver's window, and it must have hit the steering wheel as it exited as the car suddenly jerked hard to the left, causing the car's momentum to almost stand on end. Then, with a final twist, it crashed upside down inside an old foundation. It had all happened so fast, as I had just stood there in amazement, but now I started to head down the road when Clay's right arm across my chest restrained my further movement. Two seconds later, the car burst into flames that shot 30 feet in the air, followed by a fearsome explosion, and the entire car was enveloped in huge flames, leaping everywhere with the blackest smoke ever. Glancing over at Clay, I saw a smile on his face, followed by his surprising but flattering words, You don't mess with my family. Then came another surprise. Up bounded that monstrous black dog, wagging its tail like it was our best friend. In his mouth, with that bank bag. We both knelt to hug and pet this huge animal, and then he was gone over the hill again. Today, I learned more about my heritage than ever before. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much. And until next time, bye!